Welcome to PhD with Women on IT, Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young, and today's PhD positivity hack delivered will be, sorry, by our guest, Nina Segura. These glasses are funky, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It's not about um, leading with humor, although we started with the humor, with the funky glasses. Today, we're going to talk about how to lead in the post-COVID world. I'm sorry, I need to put my glasses down. <laughs> There's only how much fun it can be, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, let me remind me, this is a grassroots community that focuses on the Women on IT, inclusive forum of women in technology, startups, female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring heart to that hustle because empathy is my mojo and empathy is critical when you are leading in the post-COVID world. Nina, uh, where in the world are you today? I am here in Boca Raton, Florida. So we are in South Florida, sunny South Florida, and I know that you are experiencing a heat wave, so you all join me with the heat. <laughs> Totally. I'm joining you today from sunny Valletta. It's over 30 degrees. I'm struggling, but I wanted to learn from your experience what it's like to uh, be a leader during ab after COVID and uh, how we can tackle that challenge. Because during and after the COVID pandemic, managers are facing critical talent challenges in motivating hybrid teams. New leadership approaches and styles are required that effectively support individuals to achieve and exceed organization uh, goals. Um, in this live stream, Nina, um, the best-selling author of Every Day is Friday, we're going to um, point you to direction to this exciting new book. She's also the founder of Metaspire Consulting, which has cultivated transformational change for some of the largest companies in the world, including American Express, JP Morgan, and Hewlett Packard, saving them millions of dollars. See, she's a professor teaching strategy and influence for a women's executive program. Her work has appeared in Forbes magazine, Harvard Business Review, Amex Open Forum, CBS, iHeartRadio. After Nina's 20 plus years experience interviewing many top leaders across the globe, she found what the world needs more now than ever is more modern ways of leading. Most of these modern qualities are considered feminine in nature. So Nina, why do you think these, and what are these modern qualities that are yeah. feminine in nature? You know, it's funny you had mentioned empathy and that's one of the huge qualities that are being asked of now more than ever. And, and you know, we, during COVID for us, it was a challenge to be honest. A lot of the corporate work stopped, it paused. And it really, there was a lot of division in the United States. It was split, you know, our country was divided in, in large part. And so I just went on a quest to interview the leaders that I had worked with, you know, Audible, Zoom, all these really great top leaders of organizations to find out what leadership qualities were needed more now than ever. And even, even post COVID it's necessary. So one of the qualities you mentioned is empathy. And we find that right in our world. We, we listen to the Brene Browns of the world and we we talked about how to integrate more empathy in our world because we had never led teams that were not just virtual. They were working from their homes. They This wasn't like a planned, hey, let me make sure you have all the technology you need. There's dogs barking in the background. There's kids in the background, especially as women, right, in leadership. And so how might we be more empathetic when a cat walks across the screen, right, or something like that? And how might we be more supportive of one another? So one of the main out outputs that came out of those interviews and, and studying like the Athena doctrine and, you know, Harvard Business Review released studies on this. And there's many, many studies about how we need more what we call feminine characteristics and empathy is one of them. And, and the world in large part has been paved by men, right? The um, If you think about like 
going back, you know, we were from tribes and then from tribes, there was monarchies and then from monarchies, right? We, we continued and we, we learned from military actually, and in large part, how that command and control style leadership, you know, initially is what got us where we are today. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's got, got us where we are today, but it's not going to lead us into the future. And so what's going to lead us into the future or what women naturally have within us, the ability to cultivate, the ability to collaborate, you know, and I don't want to get too caught up on gender, but if, if I identify as a woman, right, I, it's pretty easy for me to want to nurture. And so nurture is another modern leadership persona that we identified and we have a modern leadership assessment that you can take um, and I, I think you all have the link there that you can put in the chat but you can actually it takes 10 minutes and you can identify which modern leadership um, persona that you have that the world's saying it needs more now than ever and why is that you know why are why why are they saying that and what can you do to cultivate your own leadership as well as the leadership of your team so you'll as soon as you take that assessment, it's like 10 minutes and then you'll get your report back and, you know, it'll support you. And I think that that's why I wanted to come today to talk to you, Beta, because I think as women, and I'll speak for myself, I've struggled most of my life with doubting myself and, you know, really not being sure. And I think it's because for in large part, I compared myself to men, you know, I compare myself to someone else and that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so um, I want to, I want to bring the message that I've learned, which is to really be, be kind to myself, value myself and to collaborate with you. I wanted the chance to talk to you because you're so easy to talk to um, and talk about how can we support one another as women in the workplace and, you know, especially in technologies where we're seen as sort of servants, right, to, to the business in some ways where we're actually meant to support the business. So how can we, how can we as women recognize that we are already valuable? We don't have to push ourselves any harder. We naturally have what it takes to lead and how can I inform other women of that so that they know and they can hold their worth and their value. That was a great answer, answer. really long answer. I love it. And uh, we posted the modern leadership assessment. So please uh, check it later on. Yeah. Hold on was a second. Stay with us. I see Patrick's with us. My husband, okay. Patrick, IPO feeding Patrick's opinion. Delighted to see you online again. Positivity hug delivered will be by Nina today. So Nina, I'm really excited about that. But also I'm very humbled because you asked me to answer some of the questions you prepared for these multi-dollion dollars, uh, multi-millionaires, uh, leaders. And I feel that maybe I'm not good enough. And again, as you said, we sometimes question whether we are wholesome or we are good enough or this imposter syndrome kicks in. And then you have to really ask yourself, well, I've achieved something. This is you know, when you do the list of achievement, it's so much easier. Maybe you have some way of uh, how you tackle the challenge, fighting that inner voice that is doubting in you. Oh, I love that so much. Um, actually, I don't fight with that voice. I've learned to love it. Um, and those parts of us are there for a reason. Uh, if there's something that is causing us to doubt ourselves, it's probably a younger version of ourselves. So really think about how we might be able to support that voice and say, hey, I know that you're feeling anxious right now, or I know that you might be feeling whatever way, acknowledge it, love it, it's part of us. And to be able to, to lead that part of ourselves. And the, the thought is that when we can lead ourselves, we can more easily influence others. So when we're more aligned, the, I think the best leaders hold space. And um, in order to hold space, I need to be with all kinds of diverse voices, even the voices that seem like they're fighting against me, right? And so to take a moment and really nurture ourselves and say, you know what, you did the best you could, or I know that you're going to nail it today. And to um, be with other women, I think, like you that are smart and successful, who can say, hey, I see this in you. I, I And yes, I do see it in you, Betta. I I want uh, to be a vehicle for people who embody their, their message and you're one of them. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we can do is to support and give voices to other women in the world. If we're a woman that's got an influence in any way, how can we support other women to have that influence? And that's gonna, I feel that 
that makes me feel more fulfilled than than my you know reaching my p l goals right of course i have financial goals to meet and that's important um but there's also this integration that has to occur whether you're male or female doesn't matter but there's an integration that has to occur between action and doing and hitting those financial goals and also being and being with ourselves and being with the parts of ourselves that that can it can destroy us you know louise hay has a quote I want to read it to you. She said, remember, you've been criticizing yourself for years and it hasn't worked. Try approving of yourself and see what happens. And Louise Hay is one of the little voices in my mind that kind of come in my as a nurturing, you know, kind of voice to support me moving forward. So I hope that that helps some of the people okay. here. Good, good. These voices are um, something that definitely makes us humble and uh, they, they keep us aligned with uh, our achievements with, uh, you know, uh, I believe that they are good, uh, just like you. It's part of the process. Um, and we've got a very challenging question uh, from Patrick, uh -huh. Nina. Hope you can reply to this. It's fascinating concept of, for motivating hybrid teams, but can a team ever be too hybrid? Yeah, you know, um, we, we work with Zoom on some of their, on their team building for their own team. And I think it's such a great question, Patrick. And you know what? Everybody knows their, everybody knows their own, right? Self-awareness, I think is key to answering this question because I can say, well, theoretically, this is the five ways of which you can motivate a hybrid team and have staggering schedules and make sure you have virtual coffee time. And I can give you all of those really great tips. And at the end of the day, you know, really what works best for your customers, you know, and, and it, are you retaining the best and the brightest and how, what do they need to, so that they can, you know, especially frontline employees that communicate and everybody has a customer, but even most importantly, external customers, are they feeling energetic? You know, are they, are they in service to the customer and they really in, in a space where they can they can contribute to the to the best and the highest good of the organization. So I think it's a deeper question that requires some reflection um, about a team being too hybrid. So I'd love to see more of that, you know, um, you know, more of that, more of those questions answered and, you know, by asking more questions and taking time to reflect. Um, actually, I, I'd love to read another quote if it's OK. Um, it's in my mm -hmm. book. Um, if I can find it, oh goodness. Um, primarily it's Margaret Wheatley and she says, you know, it really is about taking time to pause and reflect and the, the transformation that occurs from that time. And I know that that's, that's kind of an elusive answer, but I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think we have to think about our customers and our customers, customers. And once we do that, once we're aligned on the vision and how we're servicing our ideal clients and our customers, I think that the how we can, how we might best work together, whether it's hybrid or not hybrid, that's going to come more into light. You know, you know what I see it mean? So first mm. things first. Mm. And I'll, I'll look for that quote while we're still talking about something. Good. Else. Well, I, I actually came across the fact that some people are saying that, um, there is a zoom fatigue that's one thing yes. another thing that is a really a struggle for especially for women is when you stare at yourself on that little square thing it's yes. not healthy it's like staring in the mirror and you're always going to criticize oh maybe eyes too small yes. or you know my makeup is not aligned or why do i look so bad and uh, it's not healthy in a in a psychological sense. No. Um, it's probably not healthy in in many ways. Um, what is your way to to deal with that uh, Zoom fatigue? Well, I you can turn on Zoom. You can actually turn your camera off. Like I know you have me really big right now, and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna like keep talking because you know. So I, I you know, I you can actually turn your camera off, and then there's also ways on Zoom that where you can highlight two people at once, or you can highlight the person speaking. And so I think um, Zoom has a lot of different features right now where you can actually all look like you're in the same place. Um, so it doesn't. It looks like you're all together, even though you're not. Um, there's a lot of things that they're they're very much aware of at Zoom um, to to support that connection and that um, team building. Actually, um, one of the things that 
is a focus area at Zoom, which you probably have read. And actually, Eric, you want to endorse my book, which I just am so excited Yay! about. Um, yeah, I'm so, so excited. It just hit number one in a couple of categories. Um, but one of the things that he focuses on is this, the, the litmus test for everything is, does this make you happy? And it doesn't maybe make me happy. I've got literally, I've got a pimple somewhere over here, right? And I don't like yeah. it. And unfortunately, it's there. But what makes me happy is I really believe that somebody's going to listen to this and somebody's going to feel more inspired. And I believe that with all my heart because, um, and I'm going to read this quote because it makes sense. Thinking, thinking is the place where intelligent action begin. Um, actions begin. We pause long enough to look more carefully at a situation, to see more of its character, to think more about why it's happening, to notice how it's affecting us and others, Margaret Wheatley. And it, that's that's an aspect, you know, of feminine leadership to pause and say, you know what, does it, is this really, how important is this pimple I have right here? <laughs> you know, it's really not that important. You know, it's more important that someone is would be encouraged today by something that I could share and that they could feel inspired and go to the next level. So you mentioned your book. Uh, we've got a cover of your book. I'm very excited. I'm happy with you because that's another success story. Amazing female bringing a book. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? What? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've got a surprise for everybody too. So I, yeah, every day is Friday. Um, we're going to have a link. Um, it's available to you for free um, today and tomorrow. So you're welcome to to, to get the um, Kindle version of the book. We hope you like it and love it. Um, so today, the, the every day is Friday. I was working in worldwide technologies at American Express, and we had just identified $100 million worth of savings globally. We were really on the top of our game. And, you know, I I had this little voice inside myself that said, I have enough of this, enough of playing small, enough of doubting myself. And so I want to make every day feel free, fun, and fulfilling like a Friday. And I knew I had enough knowledge to do it. And so there's a four part system, which we go to um, in the book to make every day feel like free, fun and fulfilling for yourself and your team, um, like a Friday. And to us, Friday was, you know, when we got paid and, you know, we were celebrating, we would get pizza, you know, everybody just congratulated one another. And, and of course, we, you know, we were we were learning, you know, so and learning is a big key value for me. So every day is Friday is a book for you to make every day Friday for yourself feel Free fun and fulfilling for you and your team. So I hope that you enjoy it and love it. And um, it's a it's a reference book. There's lots of really fun stuff in there to to make your own to you know, answer your own questions. You know, there's not a lot of theory in there. There's a lot of collaboration, like you like to do, Betta, like collaborate. <laughs> Totally, totally. So since it's Friday, Wednesday, 30th of June, uh, <laughs> we welcome that uh, concept. We love it. And I have to say, one of uh, our team members is always like, uh, hello, good morning on Friday morning. It's Friday. So we <laughs> always <Friday>. celebrate. <laughs> Even with them, I'm sorry, my glasses are not are kid, uh, are kid kind of uh, uh, friendly, That's not okay. adult friendly. But we've got a question from Mike Velasco. Mike, it's great to see you. Um, how do goals help you become better leader, Nina? Oh, Mike, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think goals are just a focal point, right? Without vision. There's a scripture, that's, I'm not a superly religious person, but there's a scripture that says without a vision, people perish. And so I think goals are milestones, you know, along the way that help us remember what the big picture is, what's really important. And when we have those and we can create a shared goal, right, shared goals and shared KPIs so we're not fighting against one another, it really does support the greater vision to, to become a reality. So I think, you know, one thing, I love that question so much, especially in a virtual world, because we in the past, we might have looked at success about how many hours we work, when in reality, success really is about do we have a common goal that we're meeting? Is this are we aligned on this outcome? And so leaders are now being more careful about how they communicate outcomes. And if you meet that outcome and it takes you more or less time, you know, it, what have you, I'm not going to judge people's success based on that time, but more, more so, how did we do? And if we didn't meet the goal, 
and this is a part of feminine leadership is, you know, looking at what do we learn from it? You know, um, how do we, how might we be with ourselves when we make a mistake and how might we be with one another when we make mistakes? What do we, what can we learn? How can we be better next time? And just sit with that and not beat our, consistently replay the failing of the goals over and over again and beat ourselves up. Right. And, and, and I'm on the journey too. I'm not any different than you. Um, it's definitely something I practice. Is hmm. just, I did the best I could with what I knew and let's learn and do this next time differently. So Nina, what was your path to leadership? Was it clear? Was it always like, I'm going to be the greatest leader? No, right now, right not here. at all. I, I really honestly grew up in a really harsh environment. I really didn't have a lot of self-esteem at all. In fact, I, I thought that, that my parents were very poor and I felt like they would have been better off without me, right? I felt like a financial burden to them. And, um, you know, in, in large part, I felt like, um, you know, that that I, I, that they would have been better off, really just period. Um, so, you know, as I, be, I, I, but I, I think part of growing up in harsh environments like that um, it is really a blessing in some ways and not wishing it upon anyone. And I'd like to eradicate it, especially for women, because we know that women, create, you know, stronger peace in the world, right? Women uphold peace treaties, you know, for, for many reasons. But, you know, in any case, I think part of my journey was really one of, wow, I can see both sides. You know, my mother was a Democrat. My um, dad was a Republican. My dad was Jewish. My mom was Catholic. You know, there was a lot of, you know, conflict in, in, the, in the relationship. But I think what I learned was to be able to see both sides. And what I learned by not growing up with money is to really value the little things that I had and to be appreciative of that, which I think grows, um, you know, grows employee, right? All the things we're wanting, you know, uh, to meet our goals, employee engagement, right? And, uh, you know, all these things, service the client. Um, and appreciation, self-appreciation really does help that. But I think, no, I didn't feel, I had very low self-esteem, very, very low. And I what, what really helped me was realizing that the world actually is a really great place, that the world is a, is a there are people in the world like you, Betta, who want to contribute and be contributed to, and to look for the people that like you, who we can co-create and collaborate with so that we can be stronger together. But that's what I learned, you know, that it's not necessary to create crew, to create you know, I talk about it in my book to crew or people who are 100 percent committed to your success and you're you're committed to their success. And how do you create that? And an organization is in the book. But primarily it's, you know, looking for those key influencers who are who are givers and also receivers. And I think that's integral part of leadership. Fabulous. Uh, Nina, we've got a question from Chico Echo. But before we go into that, I wanted to ask you, because it sounds, what you're telling me, it sounds like some hippie stuff. <laughs> in the 70s. I'm sure it does. A really oh, yeah. successful business that is turning lots of money. And how does it combine? How do you combine the two? I think number one, making a commitment that I, you know, transformation happens when I make a commitment. So I'm, I made a commitment that I was going to live, not just survive. And, you know, I saw a lot of what survival was like. Um, and I had a lot of examples of that. And I just, one day I decided, listen, I don't really know what this life thing's about, but I'm going to figure it out. And so, you know, I think that's when the teachers appeared, right? That the the mentors in my life that supported me along the way, you know, the the team I have now, the great company I have now. And you know, and even so, right? When I get overbooked and they're like, hey, you're overbooked, you know, this isn't our goal. Our goal, our vision is every day is Friday. How is that happening when you're so overbooked, right? And so great building that accountability in in my organization, right? And in others' organizations. Um but yeah, maybe it is a little hippie and I'm okay with that. You know, um, I'm really okay with it. You know, I think mindset is important. So, you know, if I don't believe or value myself, how am I going to negotiate my salary? How am I going to negotiate the value of the, you know, why things take so long and why things cost so much? And, you know, how, how, how am I going to stand in that presence if I don't know it myself? And so whatever that is for you, you know, but for me, commitment is, 
making a commitment to my coach and my mastermind group. And, you know, I lead those as well. And, you know, making a commitment to my clients and being 100% present for them. And I can't do that if I'm not jogging in the morning, if I'm not doing positive mindset stuff, you know, if I'm not taking breaks along the way, I'm not going to be very good at it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm human. So I'll, I'll be crabby and complain and curse and all those things that I don't want anybody to do. <laughs> you know? I really don't want anybody doing in front of our customers, you know. <laughs> love it. Love it. Chico Echo is asking, what was a difficult decision you had to make as a leader? And how did you come to that decision? Yeah, I mean, I think that comes from my belief system. Um, I would just recently I'm looking for a HR um, partner now, you know, and we we split ways with an HR vendor um, because it was there wasn't an alignment of values with them. Um, and, and they weren't more, they were more interested in serving their own financial needs than they were the customer. And I get it, you know, finances for money is important, but we kind of caught them in a couple of things that weren't integrity based. And so even though legally I could have probably, because we had an agreement, I could have pushed it and sent a demand letter and done all those things. I just decided that, you know, I'm wishing them well, um, and letting them go along their way. And I, hippie thing again, no <laughs> self hippie thing again. Um, you know, I believe in karma and I believe that what goes around comes around. That's out. it. You know, yep. I uh, let them go. If people show you who they are, Maya Angelou said, let them go. You know, if they, they believe them, you know, and if they're, you know, that's it. So, oh, there's more questions. This is so nice. Uh, oh. Yay. Jamil. Jamil is asking, what is your, I'm oh, sorry. What is your approach when you are not clear about achieving your goals on time? I love this question because I think, um, you know, we pressure ourselves, right? Like if it's not done at this time, then it's not right. And it's a black and white world and it's got to be this one particular way when maybe, maybe we won't achieve our goals on time. Maybe, maybe that's part of the learning process instead of like pressuring and forcing. Right. And so I think if I'm not clear about achieving my goal, I, I first of all, I got to know what the goal is. And, you know, if it's not on time, then there's a lesson there. Maybe I didn't value it enough. Maybe I pushed myself too hard and I could be more kind with myself and not push myself that hard. Right. And I'm talking from an individual perspective and it's different with a team. Like if I'm leading a team, that's different. Right. Um, and, and, and it's not that much different, right? Yesterday we had, you know, um, a couple, our marketing team made a couple mistakes and it was so good. Like one of the technology person said, Hey, just let me know when that happens. And everybody took full responsibility for their part. So I think number one, take responsibility for what you're really wanting. And number two, you know what, if you don't reach your goal on time, there's always now, you know, there's always now until you until there's no more breath in your lungs, you always have time to try again. Totally. And also it's uh, the startup mantra. Done is better than perfect. Sometimes yes. you just have to deliver what you have rather than polish the things. Nelia Mendoza, any advice or tips to an individual who wanted to be a leader in the future? Nelia, well, that's a sweet question. I love it. And you know what? You're showing, I witness leadership now, Nelia. Uh, that's, uh, leaders ask questions. The best, you know, you, we, I want to, I want to remind you that that's definitely leadership right there. You know, when you ask questions, guess what happens? You then become the person that people are listening to and their answer then, you know, you re think about it, you know, you, that's, you're already a leader. I would say embrace your leadership, you know, love your, love your leadership, love, because leaders think about the fact that the best leaders take responsibility for their world and their impacts, whether that impact is intentional or unintentional, they take responsibility. And so if you want to be a leader, consider that you were born a leader. I think, I do think that everyone leads, they might not be really effective at it. Right. But everybody's creating some kind of impact. So when you say leader, I don't know if we're collapsing that definition with someone who has decision-making authority or some kind of title, but just consider that um, leaders, you know, the best leaders are the ones who ask questions and, and take responsibility, which you just did. So I, 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 see, I see you. I see your leadership. Keep asking. 
Nelia, we keep our fingers crossed for you, for your success as a leader. Uh, you ask questions and uh, leaders ask questions. That's what Nina says. Uh, so I definitely um, keep my fingers crossed for you. I would also encourage you to find a mentor because I think if you have asked this question and you will have that drive and you have the capacity to do that, ask around who could be your mentor to become a leader and be successful leader. Because um, we were chatting last night, uh, Nina, and uh, I was telling you about my difficult background and my upbringing and uh, oh, we chatted about the fact that uh, so much of it was learning from the bad examples as well as the good examples of leaders. So, um, you know, so often I would think, hmm, I don't want to be this kind of leader. And uh, we, we had bad examples, bad managers. We had terrible experiences. And this is something that is coming uh, in line with this question from In Love and in Pain. Uh, don't worry, Nina. Uh, this is just the title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about emotions. So as a leader, how will you handle someone in your team who doesn't want to follow instructions? That's a very interesting one. I'm curious what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, um, I just want to say one other thing um, about the last question before it is, um, you know, you, you there's leaders, you know, when you have access to the Internet, right? So so access to the Internet means I can now look for unofficial mentors like Richard Branson's one of my unofficial mentors I don't know him but I, I watch how he leads I watch what he does I, I I admire him and so he's an unofficial what I call crew member somebody to look up to so consider finding people like that you know online that you like Louise Hay is another one right I don't know her never met her now do I have in-person mentors yeah 100% but I also have people that I just kind of follow and admire and I'm like how do they do that and make sure you know kind of see how I'm aligned with that so just consider that um, you know, you can have lots of mentors, and they don't necessarily have to be people you know. So just consider mm -hmm. that. Um, so I would ask you, love and in pain, which sounds very um, integrated and um, broad. You know, broad. Um, I, I think you would think big picture. So consider, um, you know, what is this? If this person doesn't follow instructions, one or two things probably is happening. I'm either, um, and this is just in my own experience, I'm either giving them too many instructions and they want to do it a different way and I'm not communicating the outcome. Um, and I don't really, it doesn't matter to me how someone does things as long as the outcome is as what I'm looking for, right? Like this is the, the, the goal we want to meet. We want 16, you know, women leadership power board of directors members, or we want whatever the outcome is, right? The output. And if they have a different way of doing it, then let them do it. Does it really matter that they're not following my exact instructions? Or, you know, like, why do I need to be so close to that, right? I don't need to tell people how to do things. Maybe they have a better way of doing it. And then the second thing might be, if they're not following my instructions, that they're not either emotionally invested in the big picture. Um, I actually just thought of a third one. Or maybe their strengths are in a different area. You know, Albert Einstein said, everyone is a genius. But if we teach, if we tell a fish to climb a tree, the fish is going to live their whole life thinking they're stupid. So maybe I haven't, leaders take responsibility for their world. So if that's the case, what can I do as a leader to see what, um, you know, is that, are their strengths aligned with the outcomes that I'm wanting? Maybe their, maybe their strengths are in a different place. So, or maybe they just need emotional encouragement or maybe I'm being, you know, too micro management on them. So consider that. And you can read a book called Situational Leadership by um, Ken, Blan um, Ken Blanchard and it's fantastic. So I encourage you, there's really good questions in there. Uh, so, you, so you can ask and learn how you can be a better leader. I hope that helps. I hope so too. One of the things I, I can't switch off when I think about leaders and, and leadership, when I look at the, the structure of the household, usually the mother is the leader of the child. And then the father figure is kind of because of the how we are brought up, you know, majority of, of the families are run by, by mothers and they nurture the child and they make sure that, uh, you know, the child has eaten and so on. But we 
let them do it them, themselves. So sometimes, you know, they mess the food around, <laughs> but this is the important process, right? First time they mess the food around. And this is my approach to, to the answer in, to in loving in pain. You know, you don't, not necessarily have to follow instructions. That's, the spoon doesn't have to be kept this way. It can be kept whatever way, as long as the child starts to eat. So that's the outcome we are thinking about. So, so that, that would be my comparison. And we've got another question from Trixie. Let's move to this. Any traits that we should avoid as a leader? I love this question. Um, you know, in the modern leadership assessment, you'll uh, when you take it, it's modernleadershipassessment.com, I think, um, you would uh, know what traits lead me to the outcomes that I'm wanting and what traits don't. Um, so if you're a strong leader and you have a very strong presence, we call that kahuna. And in the kahuna, um, how can I be more integrated in my leadership, right? So and I really love this question. I just want to say because really leadership all leadership is, is traits, right? It's behaviors. It's, you know, if you think about think think about it, you know, I, there's lots of models for what leadership is, but if you really think about it, it's really just, you know, traits and behaviors. So, um, so what behaviors are giving me a positive outcome that I can, that I, that's the one thing I can control, right? Or at least most of the time. So, um, you know, you're welcome. I saw that. Um, <laughs> that's so nice. Um, yeah. So think about, you know, you know, and, and so when you see the modern leadership assessment, if you are a kahuna, one of the and you're you're very strong, you're very opinionated, perhaps one of the ways that that can come across is sort of demotivating. Right. And so um, it will tell you how might I be more integrated in my leadership and, um, you know, avoid that because maybe it's not getting me the outcome that I'm wanting. So it's something to consider. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm being too flexible on the other end, right? Maybe I'm not standing up for, hey, this is the way that we as an organization work best or as a team. So think thinking about that. And I think it's really based on the situation and the outcome that you're wanting. I know I said outcome like 200 times already. But <laughs> it really is, you know, something that I'm noticing in a post-COVID world that's so important. You know, nurture in a post-COVID world. We haven't seen some of our family members in a, in a while or we're just getting to see them again and sort of reevaluating some of the friendships that we had. And I think, you know, um, and reevaluating some of the relationships, right? The vendor relationships for professionally and professionally is now, now is a really good time that we can't use COVID as an excuse anymore in some ways, right? I can't see you, you know, and for, <laughs> for some of us because of COVID, right? When we, you know, so it really, I think COVID as, as, as it was horrible, you know, as people, people died, people got very sick. Um, we're still, you know, in many areas still fighting it. I think it, I think the best leaders think about what they can learn from something and how is something happening for us. So, um, you know, this, this question is a, is a big one, you know, what traits should we avoid as a leader? <clears throat> so I, that was it. That's all I had. <laughs> Fabulous. Oh, I, I, I love it. I love this topic very much because, um, as a man, as a manager, I used to go through career ladder, and I thought, you know, the most important thing is to be on top. And then I started my own business, and then the most important thing is to have my team. And the longer people stay with you, that's the more success you have. But then I learned that sometimes, even if you're a leader, and even if you're creating leaders within your community it's okay to let people go because that means they've grown and outgrown the company and that's a level of success in a way, right? Absolutely. You know, I love I, that question was really that the leadership traits really, it's still sitting with me a bit because, you know, I think it's an evolution. Um, and that's why I do believe that women make the best you know, naturally, you know, if we're, if we're in our, I think women do make the best leaders, you know, I'll go, I'll go, go further to say that, you know, yes, there's men that can be very nurturing as well and be great, amazing leaders. But if you think about how women across the nation have, have led their countries through COVID, 
many of the women have had more success as, as governmental leaders than some of the male leaders. Um, and, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with male, you know, male leaders. There's great male leaders. Eric, you want to zoom as one of them, right? But I think that's because in large part, he's also integrated and incorporated a lot of his, you know, feminine leadership traits, you know, of, of thinking about happiness, you know, and thinking about those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, it's deep thoughts, deep thoughts. Totally, totally deep thoughts. And uh, I, I have to also mention the fact that when we have female leaders, I, I've noticed a big change in approach to parenting because we can have equal opportunity workplace where not only females are excused because they have to attend school, it's also males that are, you know, nurturing the kids and they can leave earlier and they can attend this you know theater of their kids and so on this is so much better work environment when you've got equality and when you've got understanding of parenting rights of what is important for your team right I what is that, important yeah. that's life life uh, uh, work balance is vital for the success of your company. Work-life balance, yeah. And also like asking how people want to be treated, you know, and one of the things that when a new new relationship starts or even if a relationship is kind of not doing very well, is to sort of ask like, how might we best be together when we need to make decisions or we're in conflict? And to talk about those things, not in the heat of a, of a, of a disagreement, but to talk about things like that before disagreements happen so that you're sort of in the green zone um, and you're building on, you know, a solid foundation for for the relationship. And, it, you know, when, when you think about it, you know, natural fragmentations happen in organizations, right? You have sales and marketing that sometimes can be at odds. And, you know, we've worked with, you know, worldwide um, marketing and direct sales at Hewlett Packard and supporting them and bridging the gap between marketing and sales. And, you know, natural fragmentation is going to occur just it's going to happen so how might we best be with you know making sure that we're listening and supporting one another same with ops and technology right there's you know ops and ops better faster cheaper why are you taking so so long to create this beautiful product that i keep changing my mind on how i wanted to go um you know or you know what why 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 can't all this you know hardware work properly you know and and you're just trying to figure out what you're supposed to do based on a script or something but you know it's really about i go back to the beginning you know go back to pausing and what kind of impact do i want to make here you know what mm -hmm. oh this is the thing i wanted to tell you and it's so important you know People do remember we we had uh, in South Florida we had a building fall you probably saw it and we knew um, what two of the people in the building one of the um, women on the fourth floor and she passed away and we hadn't seen her in a long time and we thought wow you know she, Francis always made us feel joy you know that was the impact she had and so consider when you're thinking about goals and that kind of thing that you think about the feelings also because that's what people are really going to remember at the end of the day you know it's it, yes numbers are important i get it totally get it you want both um mm -hmm. but, you know think about how 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 do i want this customer how do i want this employee to feel how do i want to feel and think about putting those kind of kpis in place because that's how people make decisions not just about money right like sometimes people want want more of that you know more good mm. feeling mm. You're gonna call are me again i know it the feeling of hippie, the hippie comment coming up. <laughs> it wasn't in a negative way. Come on, the hippies were great. I like them. It. <laughs> totally. So it's positivity hub delivered, but we've got a question that is may not be so positive, but it. we are looking for positive outcomes. Any worse experience while you are leading? Yeah, um, you know, I, I was about 30 years old and I um, at American Express and I like really climbed pretty fast up the corporate ladder. And, um, you know, I was young, you know, young, I'm a woman, you know, uh, mostly men at the time. Um, and uh, I was cocky, you know, I was egotistical and cocky and I, you know, didn't get so, so much, so many good reviews from some of the people I was working with. And I got put on a leadership development plan 
and I had to write down all every conversation I had. There was a woman who wanted the position that I had gotten and she just didn't want me there. And so everything I had, I write down everything she said. And I learned about different leadership qualities, you know, different ways to relationship leadership. And, you know, I'd always been strong in thought leadership and strategy, but I wasn't always so good at relationships. And so I was, you know, I didn't like that very much, right? Of course, nobody likes writing all that down, but it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I learned about um, Myers-Briggs and DISC, and I learned about so many different ways that people think. And it was a real opportunity for me, even though it was painful at the time. And I thought it wasn't fair. They were targeting me because I was young and I was a woman and how dare they? But I really, I, I, Every opportunity like that's like, okay, enough of this, enough playing small, you know, I, there's got to be something better than this. I'm ready. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find out, you know? And so, I, yeah, that, that, that I love it. I love it. Ready, I'm I'm glasses on and we've got another question. What can you say about the famous saying, a good leader is a good follower, Nina? I love this question so much because we think about the evolution of leadership. <laughs> see if you can see if you can take me seriously with these glasses on. Um, you know, think about the evolution of leadership, right? We talked a little bit about it. Um, you know, it really did come from a command and control style way of leading in it. And if we, we do too much of that, we're going to get into more wars, right? We're going to have wars in, in our companies. We're going to have wars in our world if we keep that up. Um, so... Um, so this question is a great question because I think I think that it's multidimensional. I think look look at the situation and take that space to think about what what do I want to achieve here and how will I know I'm successful? How will you know we talked about feelings and hard tangible right things that actions or goals and then you know how what's the best role for me to play? You know if I'm dominating a conversation, then maybe it's time for me to sit back and and let awkward silence occur so that someone can be raised up in their leadership. You know, what what can I do to to create again, you know, that that space of for people to learn? Um, and is this somebody I really want to invest in? Because maybe I don't. Maybe I, you know, maybe maybe I don't want to follow. Maybe it's time for me to step up in my leadership and say, this isn't working and it's insane to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Let's try something new. And this is my proposal. So I love it. Um, but I, I do think that it's all multidimensional and thinking about that situation and being in that situation. And from that, then deciding, you know, what when do I, you know, and trusting, you got to trust, right, the, the leader within that intuition that I think we're all born with um, to support us in that leading. Leading. So I love that question. It's a great, a great mm. question. I, I would add, Nina, to also the, the, be inclusive in your team. So what it means, you need to take other people's opinion and, and try to make them speak up because then by gathering all the out, all the outcomes, your favorite word, <laughs> all the opinions, and uh, and having the broader uh, opinion, it's it's going to be so much better product. Whatever you're working on, having other people's opinion it really is going to make it so much better. Because also that means the team will be on board because they will feel part of the process. They will feel, oh, I contributed something. It's like sitting on the board of directors. You need to make sure that people are part of the conversation rather than, okay, let's agree. And John is saying something, so let's go for it. Yeah, right? the person who talks the loudest isn't necessarily the one that is closest to reality, right? And closest to what we, you know, and, and that's what I think we're, if you're listening to this, you're on the change team. You're not listening to this if you're not on the change team. So I think we're being called to step up into that leadership and that confidence and and say, yeah, I think, you know, I, I this is what I think. And I'm going to take go out on a limb here, you know, and 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 and, and build connections with people who also agree with you. Right. And getting, you know, getting uh, key influencers to agree with you and, and, and support you. And sometimes maybe they're not ready for that and it might require a little patience on our parts. Um, but I think we're the ones that are going to be the change we wish to see. I believe it hundred percent. 
totally. Mariani is asking a very tricky one. We've got uh, 10 minutes to the end of the show. So okay. let's let's get this question going. Hello, Nina. Can't wait to read your book. Can't wait to. Uh, can you share some tips on how to make someone old, like a grandpa or grandma, to listen to you? Yeah, there's actually, I think it's chapter nine in the book. It talks about the change curve um, and it talks about like how um, one question for you to think about is like what um, what's important to grandma or grandpa? Right. What's important to them? What 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 are they motivated by? You know, what are they afraid of? Like, really, like, get to know them. Um, and you probably do, but it's what they would admit they're they're afraid of or what they would admit they're motivated, not necessarily what I think they should be, um, you know, motivated by, right? So, um, so I think knowing that and then also knowing, like, how is it that, what, what am I trying to communicate that's related to what they're admitting um, or what they're wanting? And this, by the way, goes for grandma, grandpa, or the CEO of the billion dollar companies. It doesn't matter. This is a transferable skill. Um, and then looking at, well, who do they listen to? Who does grandma and grandpa listen to? And what do they have to say about it? And who don't they listen to? Um, and so, you know, it's really, there's some analysis to be done about um, motivational factors. And then from there building, you know, sort of a, a communication plan um, on, on, on from there. So I hope that helps a little bit. Mm. I, I, I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny because I was thinking about not so much my grandpa and grandpa, grand, grandma because they, uh, they are long gone, but um, I was thinking about the fact that uh, I was really frustrated with my mother-in-law because whenever I was looking after my daughter, she would say, uh, it wouldn't be like criticism directly, but it would be, mm, I would do it differently, but you do it your way. And it was really getting on my nerves because I you do it your way. Your way. Your way. <laughs> and first of all, I think sometimes your family members just want us to listen to them, not necessarily do what they want. So sometimes you just have to nod your head and say, that's lovely grandma, that's lovely grandpa, but do it your way. Sometimes you have to do it in hiding. That's okay too, because it's it's a completely different mindset. And I understand it. I get it. Like my daughter, for example, is so, so much about LGBT rights and so on. And she wants to be part of that process and so on. And it's okay. It wasn't so trendy in my times. We just took it as, as a given, like, you know, it's normal. But now it's kind of a hype. So it's okay. I accept that. She wants to do her own things, her tattoos and stuff. That's okay. And you have to listen. And it goes both ways, whether it's grandma, whether it's grandpa, whether it's your mother-in-law. And it brings me the story of my mother-in-law, another story, um, when she was, uh, because she's living on her own, and she, at one stage, she was telling me a story. We came over for Christmas uh, to Ireland and we were in Belfast and we were having a lovely time. And she said, you know what? It's really difficult to be lonely because at one stage I went to the shop and the lady asked me, how are you today? And I discovered I lost my voice because I'm living on my own. I didn't know that I lost my voice. And I don't talk to myself. So the only person I talked to, I tried to talk to, I lost my voice. So I'm thinking, you know, there are so many opportunities. Use this opportunity to listen to your grandpa, listen to your grandma. And this is all they really want. Maybe not necessarily all the time to follow them. You don't have to be the leader of your grandma or grandpa. They are part of your family and they have experiences somewhat different than ours. But listening is what they probably I love that I never thought of it you know it makes so much sense if I want somebody to listen to me am I listening to them that's awesome mm. so good funny. okay sorry I exceeded uh, our time for questions <laughs> <laughs> how uh, oh the top five skills all leaders should have whether it's a male or female what would you say are the top 
soft skills. Yeah. Skills. I have a I have a talk on this on YouTube actually. Um and there this is based on you know the research too and it's the acronym power P O W E R. Um and and uh the acronym P is for patience, you know, and I'm not patient. I'm just telling you really honestly what the research says and that's why I hit it really hard in the beginning of this saying listen if you can't be patient at least pause and pause and get a different perspective so you can have a good plan. So that's P for power. Uh, for the first letter of the acronym power. O is for openness, right? And we talked a lot about that today, being open, you know, listening to diverse perspectives, maybe even that voice that says, oh, you're going to screw all this up. People aren't going to listen to you. Look at your hair. It's all messed up from the humidity, right? Um, whatever it is. But be open to those perspectives because maybe, um, and diverse perspectives, especially, maybe that's trying to tell you something. Maybe get up earlier so you can blow dry your hair, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then W is warm. W is for warmness and warm, you know, being warm and being expressive, you know, uh, expressive is the next one. E is for expressiveness. But being warm and being in touch with our feelings, really, honestly, is don't you think the world would be a better place if people acknowledge that they had feelings and could express them in a, in a clear, kind way? I mean, wouldn't that be fantastic, right? Like, hey, I'm happy or whatever, you know, instead of shaming ourselves for having a feeling or, you know, uh, whatever. So warmness, you know, really letting ourselves feel our feelings, especially empathy, right? So expressiveness um, is the, is the uh, for E. So uh, patience or pausing, whatever you want to say, openness, O for uh, openness, W is for warm, being warm, you know, having enough to give. Um, and then E is for expressiveness. And so how do I express myself in a way that's respectful of my own value and respectful of values of the people around me? And then R is for responsibility. The best leaders take 100 percent responsibility for their impact, you know. And, and so I would say that those to me are the keys of what I've been talking about a lot, which is integrated leadership, you know, looking at what are the best characteristics that we have in, in the masculine world, you know, strategy and, and structure, and we need all that and actions and goals, right, all of that. And then also, what do we need vision and, you know, um, you know, we need reflection on the feminine side, right? So how do we, how do we compile all that? And so we, I put the acronym power together for you. And I hope that you like that. I'd love to hear. I that. love it. Power, power, patience, openness, warm, expressiveness, responsibility. That is really powerful power. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yay. We are coming uh, coming to the end of our show. Uh, it's time for my favorite questions. Can you please give us your favorite life lesson quote? And can I, I thought about um, this and I, I went back and forth with it. It's a really tough question. I wanted to tell you, forget it. I can't just come up with one. But I, I will tell you the one that is really um, something that I've honor, I, I honor. And it's Joseph Campbell. And it says, if you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living wherever you are. If you're following your bliss, you're enjoying that refreshment, that life within you all the time. Um, and that really has led me to. Um, I guess Joseph Campbell is somewhat of an ideal father for me. You know, if you read his works um, and all his studies that he's done in so many different parts of the world and to bring that together in such a great, um, so many great writings. Um, but yeah, I would say that that's my favorite, favorite quote mm. and, and relevant, you know. Good. Well, we have to have more shows to, to get other life lesson quotes from you. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. That's the life. That's uh, our goal. Um, are you working on any exciting new projects now, apart from your book? Um, every day is Friday. Well, I work with Women Leadership, um, Women Women Leadership Power. Um, we are an invitation-only community where we share best practices and we accelerate one another's success. Um, so I'm really, really enjoying that. Um, we have women, it's a virtual meeting, and then we do meet in person once a quarter. Um, and really, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience to also be challenged by. I started jogging now. I do two miles a day, um, and I never thought I would do that, but it was because of the women in the group that challenged me and supported me and some of my health goals. So, yeah, I love it. Um, love it so Good. much joy and they're, they're challenging each other too you know so it's nice to like hey if you're from so and so and you know it's just nice to build a community of people that are up for it you know they're up for wanting that wanting to do better together 
fabulous. Imagine the pandemic is over and you can invite to breakfast any person in the world who would you love to have a private breakfast with and why and which place would you choose, Nina? Okay, so I have to say, this is such a great question. I, I, you know, I went back and forth with like, okay, I think it would be Barack Obama or Michelle Obama, you know, and, you know, or maybe it would be Joe Biden, who I had the pleasure of meeting. Um, and I, I think that would be all fantastic. But I thought, I really thought about it. I have to say the person that I really want to have breakfast with is, you know, I, you know, and I realized that it's the my husband, um, but I, I, I really enjoy having breakfast with my husband. I don't really have anybody that I long to to meet and interview because I just feel like the people find me or are meant to find me and I find them. Um, so I, I'm sorry to disappoint you with that question, but that I'm, I'm most happy having breakfast with my husband um, as much as I can right here in our kitchen in South Florida, <laughs> five minutes from the beach, which you know you're welcome to come and visit when you come. When you come to South Florida, I mean, you better make sure you call me because I want to see you and meet you in person. I will definitely do that, Nina. That's uh, in my calendar and uh, on my to-do list. Uh, and where would you like to have it? Is it your home or somewhere you know what, else? Right here in my house. There's no place like home. You know, we oh. um, we worked really hard for this house. It's built in 1952, and um, we, my husband and I, remodeled it from soup to nuts. And um, there's no place I'd rather be than where I am right now. So. Um, Fabulous. Fabulous. Nina, it's been a pleasure to talk about the um, leadership in the post-COVID world. I hope all our viewers are going to take example. As Confucius says, tell people and they may forget, show them, they may remember, but involve them and they will understand. That's a great lesson for the leaders of the future. We have to involve our communities, when our teams, no matter how small. To stay updated and you ensure you never miss a positivity hack delivered, follow Women on IT and turn on notifications to be alerted once a video has been released. Today's topic is over. Nina is still here with us. She's got her book. Uh, we uh, added the links to her book. Um, we have to uh, cultivate our feminine uh, characteristics. We have to collaborate, nurture. That's the women uh, in leaders uh, that we need to nurture our traits and uh, our successful approach to the modern leadership. Take a pause and reflect. That's also Nina's uh, advice. Patience, pause, power, responsibility, uh, openness, warm uh, expressiveness comes from Nina's lesson today. As always, our positivity quote comes from positive thinking only and goes, look for something positive in each day, even if some days you have to look a little harder. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude, as Maya Angelou says. Today is your day to hug the future, hike the positivity you want. And don't forget to join us next week to learn how to create your own software. Nina, it's been a joy to have you today. It's been really fantastic. I love it. I enjoyed it. Always have fun with your team, no matter how small, no matter how big. And have the positivity you want. Thank, That's you. A thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great day.